Praise the Lord. So we're looking at the Holy Spirit. And we're studying out of 1 John chapter 5, verses 6, 7 and 8, to see how this Holy Spirit becomes the point of witness in God. He is the evidence of God. And so in our last session, we were seeing that there was a witness in heaven. There was the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. And this evidence is the witness that God is real. And so we went through and we discovered how this evidence is of one God. Father is God, His Word, and His Spirit. So now we begin to look at the next part of the witness of God. And this is the one that really is more important to us in some way, because this is where we are involved in the witness in the earth. So in verse 8, it says, There are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So this is the heavenly witness, and we saw how true this is. One God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But now we have a witness in the earth. And the witness in the earth looks like this. The water, the blood, and the spirit. And these three, and this is significantly different, agree as one. Remember, the witness in the heavens was one. One God. But for the witness in the earth to reveal that God is real, something else has to happen. Something has to come into agreement. The water, the blood, and the spirit, and these three agree as one. So what are these elements and what agreement has to take place? Well, the first thing we recognize is that the spirit in the earth is the same as the spirit in heaven. This is the Holy Spirit in the earth. God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And so this is the Holy Spirit of God, which we have determined is actually the presence of God is now in the earth by his spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the earth he is the presence of God in the earth. And so he is here to be part of the witness of God in the earth. But who is the blood and the water? We need to understand who these things are so that we can see what has to happen. And so we're just needing to understand that blood and water is actually the human being. This is the creature that God has created. Everything that God creates in the earth is born of blood and water. If we see in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus came by blood and water. Verse 6, this is he who came by, well, water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. And so we're seeing that this water and blood, which represents the human creature, needs to come into agreement with the Spirit of God to become a witness for God. Jesus was born in the flesh. He came in the likeness of a man, but he came into agreement with the Holy Spirit. When he rose out of that, out of that baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him and the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus began to walk from that moment as a witness for God in the earth. It was the Spirit that bore witness. And for the earthly witness to continue, you and I need to come into agreement with the Holy Spirit that we might become the witnesses of God. The point that we need to catch here is that we ourselves are not a witness for God. We are just human beings. But when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, when we come into agreement with God, now we become a witness for God in the earth. You know, we all were once dead. 
And God came into the earth to begin to minister to us. And so Jesus was the first witness. So Jesus was the word of God. And the Holy Spirit is ministering through his life to minister to people. And so the word of God comes to people. And the people reject the word of God, so they stay dead. But then the word of God comes again. And the people finally agree with the word of God. So once we come into agreement with the word of God, then we can come alive again. Once we come into agreement with God and the Holy Spirit can come into our life, now we come alive. Only by the Spirit of God can we receive the Word of God. And only by the Word of God can we come into a relationship with the Father. So the Holy Spirit is in the earth and the Word of God is in the earth and they are ministering to dead people that they might come to life. This is the process of salvation. Dead people are without God. Once they receive the word of God, they come alive and they are born again by the spirit of God that comes into their life. Then they are born of water as they enter into their death, burial and the resurrection of the cross. And then they come into the new creature who is Christ, who is the new man, and this becomes the witness of God in the earth. We once were all dead, but by receiving and coming into agreement with the word of God, we come to life again. We are born again. We are born of water coming through the baptism and entering into our resurrection. And we enter into Christ. We are born of the spirit. You know, there's so much talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, but in actual fact, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply entering in to the fullness of Christ. Christ is the Spirit. And when we enter into Christ, we become baptized into the Spirit of God and into our eternal life. We once were dead. We are now alive. We are born again, awakens our heart. We are born of water to rise from the dead. And we are born again into Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. This is the Christian life. Where, where do we live our Christian life? We live it in Christ. We are born of the Spirit. We are baptized into the Spirit of God, the resurrection man, the new man, the blessing of God, Christ, the eternal man. These are all the same person. And this is where we live our life now. Our Christian life is lived in Christ, resurrected from the dead to live in Christ. And so as, as Christian people, we don't live in the world any longer. We live in Christ. And we live our life from Christ. And so here's the, the pattern. We once were dead, blood and water. We heard the word of God. We believed the word of God. We received our life. We entered into the resurrection. We became the children of God in Christ. And then the Father sends us into the world as his ambassadors. And it's the word of God that's in our mouth that we're speaking into the world to dead people. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. Everywhere we go, the Holy Spirit is there. God has sent his spirit into all the earth. And now he sent us into all the earth to speak the word of God. This is our purpose and function in this period. We are to speak the word of God into the world so that the Holy Spirit can take that word, minister it to dead people, and they might come alive through the word of God. The witness in the earth. People filled with the Holy Spirit. And so you and I are in this process now. We are in Christ. We're going to look at Christ. We're going to see the church. We're going to understand the various functions and roles within this. But we must understand that we once were dead, but we are now alive. Where is that life? It is in Christ. How did it happen? It happened because we came into agreement with God. We came into agreement with the Holy Spirit. We said, yes, Lord. We have sinned. We need a Savior. 
Father, forgive me. Yes, you are forgiven. We come alive. We water, go through the waters of baptism. We enter into our grave and then we rise again to enter in to the fullness of that which God has got for us. We are baptized into Christ. Hallelujah. Into the Holy Spirit of God. This is our eternal life. This is the new man. This is the resurrection man. This is the blessed man. And so we now live our life from here. We are no longer part of the world. We are part of the heavenly man, Christ. And God sends us from here to be witnesses into the world. Not to be a part of the world, but to be witnesses into the world. What is the witness? The witness is the word of God, which is in us by the spirit of God. And we speak and work with God to minister to dead people. We become co-laborers again now with God in the earth. This is the function that we must have. Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. And we can see we are to work together. We are to co-labor together with God. This is what we are now to do. This is the earthly. What is the earthly witness? It's human beings who have come into agreement with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. We are co-laborers together with God. As the heart of the Father comes into the world to minister to the dead people that they might come to life and return to live with him forever. And you and I are now working with him in this process. We are part of the harvesting team, which is to go into the earth and take the message of salvation. That's why Jesus just made a simple statement to us. He said, now go into the earth, preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Praise the Lord. So, the witness in the earth, it is man coming into agreement with God and being filled with the Holy Spirit and becoming the witness that God is sending into the earth. So the Holy Spirit is with us today. He is in us to magnify the Word of God. And He is in the world today to take the Word that we speak and take it to minister to dead people. You know, the Holy Spirit is everywhere. God has put His Spirit into all the earth. Wherever you go, where, wherever God sends you, the Holy Spirit is already there, waiting. And the Word of God is in us. He said, I put the Word of reconciliation in you. Remember, God said, would you minister for me? The ministry of reconciliation, what is that? It's to go. And I've given you the Word of reconciliation. Just as Jesus, in the first instance, Jesus was the Word filled with the Holy Ghost. We now carry the Word and we work with the Holy Spirit to minister to dead people. Without the Word, the Holy Spirit can do nothing. And without the Holy Spirit, the Word can do nothing. They are one. They're all working together. What for? To bring the heart of the Father to the dead people and bring them back to life again. And so this is the work we are doing. This is the witness in the earth. We are the witnesses of God because the Holy Spirit is with us. I want to just draw your attention to something which I found very fascinating. Uh, as we look at John chapter 19 and verse 34. In John chapter 19 and verse 34, we see something quite fascinating as it refers to the water and the blood. John chapter 19 and verse 34. We're talking now about the witness of God in the earth. This is where we now fit in to God's plan to win the lost children. We must become a witness of God. How do we do that? Well, we come into agreement with God. We receive the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is the witness through our life by the Word of God to the saving of the lost children. Jesus was one. But the Bible says he was to be the firstborn of many. There was one man ministering. 
Now there are multitudes of people who have received their salvation through agreement with the Holy Spirit and have now been sent into all the earth to minister and to be the ambassadors and messengers of God. This is our work. It's important to know this because without the Holy Spirit, we are not a witness. If we're not with God, we are not a witness. Many people say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, why are you a Christian? Well, because I said I am. No, you're not a Christian because you said you were. You're a Christian because Christ is in you. You're a Christian because the Holy Spirit is in you. And the Holy Spirit is in you because you live in agreement with him. And you're living with the Father by agreement of the Holy Spirit. You are one with God. A Christian is not by, by declaration or by title. A Christian is somebody who has Christ in them. And Christ is only in us by agreement and by submission to God. We submit to God. We agree with God. He comes into our life and we become part of Christ in Jesus' name. But I was really intrigued one day when I began to read these passages in John chapter 19. And we're reading verse 34 in particular. But the story is Jesus on the cross. You may or may not know, but when they hang people on the cross, uh, if they hadn't died within a few days they would come and break their legs so that they would collapse and they would die because the whole process of being crucified is that you can't breathe. You begin to suffocate and your lungs collapse and so forth. A very, very cruel death. And so after a few days, if the people hadn't died, they would come around and break their legs. They would collapse, therefore, and it would crush their lungs and they would suffocate and die. But because when Jesus was crucified, the next day, I think, was a day of atonement or something, uh, and they needed to get everything cleared up. So they came back in that evening to break the legs of those that were crucified that day, Jesus being one of them. And so when they came along, they found that Jesus was already dead. And we pick up the story here. Verse, so we go from verse 31. Therefore, because it was a pre preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that the Sabbath was a high day. And the Jews asked Pilate that the legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other that was crucified with Jesus. Verse 33, But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And they did not break his legs. Now, some people uh, interpret that, that they did not kill Jesus, but that Jesus gave up his life. I don't have a problem with that. But the interesting thing, the others were still alive, but Jesus himself was already dead. So what did they do? Verse 34. But one of the soldiers pierced him in his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So Jesus is on the cross and they pierced him in the side. Now, I would expect blood would come out, but the story tells us that blood and water came out of his side. So when I begin to put these thoughts together and I consider the blood and water that is in the witness or the, or the representation of that which is created into the earth and the need for that to come into agreement with the spirit, I found that there was an interesting correlation between blood and water coming out of Jesus' side and the blood and water that had to come into agreement in the earth. And I began to ask myself, why did blood and water come out of the side of Jesus, not just blood? And then I realized that blood and water, something was being birthed. And then I realized that Jesus was birthing the church on the cross. Jesus was birthing the church, which was the, the next vehicle of his uh, ministry, the vehicle of salvation uh, that God was birthing into the earth. Jesus birthed it at the cross. And by blood and water, by Caesarean section, you could say, the church was birthed into the earth at the cross. And then if we were to go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, 
we see that the Holy Spirit was poured out onto the church and the church became at that point agreement between the church and the Holy Spirit and God developed his, uh, his new witness into the earth. The church, which was to become the witness of God, was birthed on the cross, came into agreement with the Holy Spirit and became the new vehicle of witness. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we know it. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in all the earth. And so on the cross, Jesus birthed the church. In Acts chapter 2, God poured out his spirit onto his church. And the church became a witness in the earth for him. This was God's intention and idea. Jesus spoke a lot about giving birth. We sometimes, if we will go to Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, we can look again at these thoughts. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. We see Jesus, the Bible talks like this. It says that Jesus, for the joy, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy that Jesus was experiencing or what he was, the expectation of his life when he went to that cross? And I'm suggesting the joy was that he knew he was about to birth something which was going to transcend what he could do. The church was being birthed into the earth. This was his joy. And this is what sustained him through this period of time. Jesus talked in other places about this period would be like a woman giving birth. And so I'm quite satisfied that we could understand this. The blood and water, this is the human creature in the earth. This human creature becomes a witness when it comes into agreement with God. At the cross, Jesus birthed this church into the earth. He filled it with his Holy Spirit and he intended the church, which we will talk about in another study, the church to become the vehicle of witness and glory and testimony into the earth. The church, which is the body of Christ, which is the people who have been raised from the dead, these will become the testimony and witness for God in the earth. So here we're seeing there is a witness in heaven, one God. And we look into the heavens and we can see God is real, God is one, God is perfect. But now we see also there is a witness in the earth. How is this witness? Well, this witness is be by the people of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, the ones who once were dead, but they're now alive. We've been born again. We've become the children of God. We live in agreement with God. We live with God. And by the Holy Spirit in our life and the Word of God in our life, we are to become the witness and the testimony of God. The evidence that God is true in the earth is the witness and testimony of our lives. And so we need to again understand what is God doing? Why are we here? Well, we're here because we need to be this witness and testimony for the whole world until it's finished and Jesus comes back. We are the witness of God. We are the testimony. We are the ones whom God is sending out to become the evidence, the evidence that God is true. Our testimony is the evidence that God is true. And so the Holy Spirit is the presence of God in the earth. It's not some mystical idea or, a, or, 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 or an imagination in the mind of men. It's not a ghost. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. God is Father. Father has come by His Spirit into the earth to join with all those that will agree with Him and become part of Him so that this company of people will become His witnesses in the earth and they will work with Him, taking the spirit of reconciliation, the work of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation into the earth to help the Father to see his children come in. This is the work that we must be involved in. And so God has a witness. Who is the witness? We are the witness. Jesus was the first witness. The Holy Spirit in him was the witness. And now the Holy Spirit in us is the witness. 
And we need to understand that. And we need to live our life with this kind of understanding on our life. Otherwise, we just live aimlessly. Our job is to be the testimony of God and the witness in the earth. I want to turn to one or two scriptures just to show you again how the Lord is working in our lives to seal us and to, to make us secure that when we are born again and we are born of water and we are born of the Spirit, that these things secure our life forever. There is no need for any of us ever to be insecure in our relationship with God. But we need to understand what is God doing and what is the Holy Spirit doing in our life. The Holy Spirit, remember, is the presence of God. It's your Father with you and in you to keep you so that we can be secure and can be a witness. Again, I'm saying God does not fail. God's people should never fail. But if we don't understand what God is doing and who he is to us, then oftentimes we become confused and a little bit vulnerable to the workings and the teachings of men, which can distract us from the truth. But we need to know that God has secured us. When we came into agreement with God, we were not only born again from the dead. We were not only raised into eternal life. I want to show you that God, by his spirit, secured us forever that we are the children of God. Let me take you to one or two scriptures to show you that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll just write them in here, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're reading verses 20 to 22. Again, my heart is that when you have completed this course, you will be secure with your God. You will never doubt again. You will know exactly what God is doing in the world. You know exactly what he's doing in your life. You can get up every morning and just say, Good morning, Father. This is our day. Hallelujah. We are not wondering, Oh, I wonder if God loves me. Oh, I wonder if God is with me. Oh, I wonder whether God cares about me. These things are no longer a part of our life. We have been secured by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And he has secured us for our eternal life. We have to understand these things. And if God is with us, then we are safe. Let's read the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, actually, it's 2 Corinthians. If I said 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians there. Chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 to to 22. Listen to these words. Paul is writing. For all the promises of God in him, that is in God or in Christ, are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So Paul has said, we have brought you and given you understanding about the promises of God. And we promise you with God, everything is amen. Hallelujah. God is not a liar. What he said he will do, you can trust him completely with your life. Verse 21, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. So he's then saying that it is God who has come to speak to you and to share these truths with you. We, are the, we, are, we carry the word of God for you. It's yes and it's amen. Hallelujah. And then let us go to 22. He who has established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, 22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And so Paul is identifying that God has not only spoken to us, he has saved us and his promises are yes and amen. They are complete. God will never lie. God has anointed us to speak the truth to you, but he has also sealed you sealed you by the Holy Spirit. Listen to the words. He has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our heart as a guarantee. If the, if the Holy Spirit is with us, this is our guarantee that we are the children of God. 
We saw before how that God put the spirit of adoption into us that we would be the sons of God. If this is here and you have the presence of God in your life and that is evidenced by the peace of God in your heart and we will look at that. If this evidence is here, this is the guarantee for your life that you are a child of God. You never have to worry, am I a child of God or not? You are a child of God if the presence of God is with you. Praise the Lord. Let us look again into Ephesians chapter 1. I'm just really needing to secure you with God. So many of God's people are insecure. We don't need to be insecure. We need to be strong in our faith and in our understanding of God. So I'm just taking you through one or two of these. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 1, it's the same idea again, but listen to the words. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In him also you trusted. Listen to this little dialogue that Paul is teaching. In him also you trusted when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Remember, we once were dead. We heard the word of God, and by the Spirit of God it was ministered to our life. And when we heard it, we trusted it. We agreed with it. And so because we agreed with it, then we believed and we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So when we heard, we believed, we trusted the word, we were able to receive the Holy Spirit of promise. And that Holy Spirit of promise, we were born again, we were born of water, we were taken into the Spirit of God, into our eternal life. But listen to what Paul is saying. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. A little bit wordy, but what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, when you agreed with the word of God and God came into your heart and sealed you, he sealed you with his presence. But this seal guarantees you that when Jesus comes back at the end, he's going to come back for you. This presence of God in your life is like the down payment that God has put into your heart to seal you and to secure you and to make sure you understand that you belong to God. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to take you with him to live forever. The seal of God's presence is the guarantee that God is your God and you will be able to live with him forever. You understand? These are not, we don't have to be unsure about our salvation. If God is with us, we belong to God. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for us. Some people said like this, <coughs> that when Jesus put his seal in you, it was like a down payment. And when Jesus comes back, God is going to complete the purchase. Praise the Lord. And the deposit is paid. The seal is here. The Spirit of God is with us. And this is our security for the future. And then if we go to Ephesians 4 and verse 30, again, we're just catching this Holy Spirit's work in us. These are not isolated, miscellaneous things. Oh, it's God. I, I feel good because I'm forgiven. No, no. God's got way more than these things for you. God doesn't only want to forgive you. He wants to assure you of eternal life. He wants to take your life and cause you to live forever. Hallelujah. With the most exciting purposes that a man could ever have, God has got it for you. Your salvation and forgiveness is just the beginning. You're born again, born of water. Now you're launched into the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of God to live forever. His Christ. Christ is the one of, who has all the promises of God for your life and for mine. And in this period of time, God has sealed you for another day, which is the day Jesus is coming back, 
we can have absolute assurance today that if the Spirit of God is in us, Jesus is coming back for us. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Listen to these words. Ephesians 4, 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of promise by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So again, Paul is talking to the people. Understand, God is with you. And he's in you now so that you could be a witness in the earth. But this is just a temporary thing. This time here is just short. The main purpose of God for your life is to take you home to live forever with him. And Jesus is coming back. But while we are waiting for that time, God has secured your life by His Spirit in you. He is with you. His peace is in you. Now don't grieve Him. Live with Him. Love Him. Don't run here and there. Lift up your hands every day. Father, good morning. Bring your life unto Him. Don't fight with Him. I know so many that you, people, they just fight with God continually. Don't fight with God. He is your God. He is your Savior. He is your redemption. He is your eternal life. Live with Him. Love Him. If you don't understand something, just say, Father, I don't understand. Talk with Him. We're going to understand when we study prayer, this beautiful relationship that you can have with your God. So Paul is saying, don't grieve the Spirit of God. Love your God. Love being with Him. Enjoy Him. Submit to Him. Trust Him. Because he has sealed you for the day of promise. Hallelujah. And as long as your God is with you, you can know he's coming back for you. And if we just go to one further scripture here, Colossians 3 and verse 15. Colossians 3 and verse 15. We're just seeing the same picture. Colossians 3 and verse 15. Then we're going to take a short break. Colossians 3 and verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you're always also called in one body, and be thankful. So here we're seeing that God has sent His Spirit, which is His own presence, into the earth to bring a message to people that forgiveness is here. And whoever wants to can come into a relationship with God. They can come into agreement with God. Yes, Father, forgive me. I am a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. And your God will forgive you immediately and he will come into your heart and he will raise you in to his eternal life. He will seal you in this day with his presence because there's another day coming where we will all go on and live forever with him. But in the meantime, he said, I will seal you you will know you are my child because my presence is with you. And you will be my witness in the earth because there are many others that yet I need to bring into my family. And live with me. Allow my spirit to continue to seal your heart. Be at peace. Don't fight with me. Because in a day to come, I will be coming back and you and I will go and we will live forever. The Holy Spirit is in the world today to minister to lives, to bring them to Christ. The Holy Spirit is with us today to seal us for the day of promise. We need to understand God's presence in our life, live with him and walk with him, that we might be his witnesses in the earth in this day. So let's just take a short break, and then we will continue to look at some elements of God's work in the earth. God bless you.